Thank you Canva for sponsoring this video. Please use my link in the description to get a 45 day extended free trial of Canva Pro. Look at all these monitors. How great. I finally managed to upgrade and get a monitor that's at like a higher level so now I don't get back pain, so very exciting. I also bought an iPad mini, which is great. Yes, it has been a very expensive month. Thank you for asking. <laughs> As the world is starting to very, very slowly open back up, uh, a lot of people are starting to actually travel already, which is kind of mind blowing, but a lot of people are planning their trips to come to Japan. And I realized the other day that while I do have a lot of information on my YouTube channel already, it's all very, it's all very spread out and a lot of those videos are old and maybe a little bit outdated. So here it is, my very definitive list of things advice, tips and tricks, all of those clickable words of things that you should know before coming to Japan and planning your trip to Japan. This video may be a little bit longer than usual it's because there's a lot of information so there'll be chapters in the bottom. Scroll over to the applicable topic if you'd like to know more about that one. Let's get started. I've been watching a lot of Jenny Nicholson lately so let's all put it in a internet friendly numbered list. These are all of the topics that we'll be covering in this video and I love using this pen. I feel so official. Wow. Okay, the first one, COVID predictions. The question that everyone wants to know about, uh, when is Japan gonna be opening up to tourists? I am not gonna give any predictions because I've been wrong in the past, not publicly, but I have been wrong in the past, as we all have. It's like gambling at the moment. Anyone who lives in Japan knows I've got a lot of people messaging them, asking the same question, but we don't have any extra insight living here. I'm more up to date with the news, I suppose, but yeah, basically the government has not set any goals or any expectations of when they're planning to open, but we can only hope and assume and hope and pray <laughs> it will be sometime next year. It has to be. It has to be. I hope. <laughs> So the next one, I get a lot of people asking, what's the best time to visit Japan? And I think rather than saying the best time to visit Japan, I'm gonna say most of the times to visit Japan are great. You're gonna have a great time. But these are the worst times to visit Japan. Do not come to Japan during these times of the year. The first one is Golden Week. Golden Week is a series of public holidays in Japan. They all line up in the space of about a week. Uh, it's usually in May, but the dates change every year. And don't travel during this time because every single Japanese person and their dog will be traveling in this time. Every place gets very, very busy and it's miserable. You can just go on Google and type in like uh, 2022 golden week dates and it will tell you when that is gonna be. Avoid it at all costs. The next time is winter. Unless you're coming to Japan for like snow season or skiing or something like that, I wouldn't really recommend winter, especially if you wanna see nature because it will either be covered in snow or all the nature is just like, desaturated like there's like no green it's not very lush or anything like that everything looks prettier in like the other months and it's also really 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 freaking cold for an Australian if you are used to the winter you might find it okay but in general I would just say maybe avoid winter if you're not good with cold on the other side of the spectrum avoid summer if you're not good in the heat and if you're not good in humidity especially I've only experienced worse humidity in Singapore and I know that Australians love to pride themselves on how how good we are at handling the heat. I really don't think that, I mean, at least not where I'm from, like Queensland, I really don't think we have heat like Japan does. It's really different. It's a very, very intense, humid, especially if you're walking around a lot outside, you're doing a lot of, a lot of sightseeing and standing around, you'll get so sweaty and it'll be miserable. So maybe avoid summer if you're not great in the heat. The other time to avoid is New Year's Eve because in Japan it's a very big holiday tradition, usually from New Year's Eve and then the next like five days after it, a lot of places will be completely shut. Keep that in mind. I don't know, maybe New Year's Eve can be like exciting for some people, but uh, in Japan it's more of like a family holiday, so treated very differently. And for the best season to visit Japan, I don't know, it depends what you want to see. Autumn is really, really stunningly beautiful. Cherry Blossom is unlike any place you've ever seen before in your life. Autumn will maybe be a little less busy than Cherry Blossom season, but Cherry Blossom season is magical, so they're kind of hard to predict, so you got to keep up with the online calendars that will tell you like their predictions of when Sakura season is going to start and when autumn foliage is going to start. I've got a few more things to talk about, but first a message from this video's sponsor, Canva. So if you don't already know, Canva Pro is, oh that rhymed, is the template wonderland. They have every template you could possibly imagine for every occasion or every business need. So with just one subscription, you'll gain access to over 60 plus million premium ingredients, creative templates, stock photos, and more. Canva Pro is really easy to use. You can customize everything with the click of a button and they've got templates that look slick 
and high quality and professional for pretty much every occasion imaginable. If you're part of a large team and you like to create things together, there's now a way that you can collaborate and comment in real time, which simplifies your team's design process and helps you to create your best work together. Canva Pro is really, really useful for a lot of people around the world. And I think in my future, I will be using them a lot more for a few other things that I've got coming up. So if you'd like to get started, then check out the link in the description below for a 45 day free extended trial of Canva Pro. Thank you Canva for sponsoring this video. And of course, if you support my sponsors, that helps support me. So thank you so much for that. So the next one on the list is public transport versus renting a car. Rent a car, rent a car, rent a car. If you can rent a car, you should rent a car. If you can't rent a car, should find someone who can rent a car. No, basically, in my opinion, so I've done a lot of traveling around Japan in general, and recently I've done a lot of countryside travel. I am way more of a fan of like the countryside and nature and that kind of thing. Just in general, me as a person. If you're like that also, I think that having a car will help you tremendously. It is possible, I've been saying this, it is possible to see these places with public transport. Shinkansens are incredible. They can take you so far, so fast. They can get quite expensive. And then when you're getting out into more countryside areas, you may have to wait a couple of hours for the one bus in a day that will take you there. <laughs> so yes, it can be very time consuming if you're just catching public transport. This is again, if you're trying to get out to more naturous areas, more countryside areas. If you're in the city, do not bother renting a car. Don't do it. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. <laughs> do not rent a car in Tokyo or Osaka or Kyoto, any of them. It's just gonna be a, a complete waste of your time and money. But countryside, get a car, get a car, get a car, get a car. It's amazing, it's life changing. But of course, I'm aware that not everyone has licenses in their home country right now. So coming to Japan, you won't be able to drive. But in saying that, you can get to pretty much everywhere in Japan without a car. There's a lot of people living in Japan that don't own cars um, and don't have a license. The public transport is available, but it makes things it just takes a lot more time and it can be a bit more expensive. I would recommend a car if you can, but if you can't, you can still do things with public transport. Overnight buses are a great option. Just gotta do a lot more research, but cars really do open up your itinerary, I guess. So to drive in Japan, you'll need to get an international driver's permit. Uh, if you're from an eligible country only, there'll be a link in the description for all of the giant list of eligible countries. Off the top of my head, main countries like America, UK, Australia, you're fine, you can do it. Yes, you need to get the permit in your home country before you come to Japan. And they're pretty easy to get. I'm pretty sure I've got mine just online and it was sent to me in like a week or something like that in Australia. There is also these countries here. You can get an international permit, but you do also need to get a licensed translation. When you come to Japan, you might be able to do it online. There'll be a link for that in the description as well, as well as a whole bunch of other links. So much research, so much free information. I've harped on enough about cars. They're very, very helpful. You can do it without. Let's move on to the next topic, which is all very tying in very nicely, the JR Pass. So if you can't drive or if you're just kind of wanting to get around Japan quite quickly, jump from city to city, area to area, Shinkansens are really, really excellent option. They're very fast and Unfortunately, they're not very cheap, which is where the JR Pass comes in play. A lot of people ask, are the JR Passes worth it? This is all subjective and it all very much depends on where you plan to go. Oh, the background's changed. That's nice. <laughs> 10 points if you can rec if you can recognize like where, where this place is. As I was just saying, the Shinkansen is quite expensive. For example, to get from Osaka to Tokyo, it's about two and a half to three hours, I think, right? And it costs you $130 one way. Just for reference, when I talk about dollars, I'm basically just converting the Japanese amount into US dollars because I feel like it's a lot easier for most people to do the comparison a little bit easier if I put it in US dollars, as opposed to just leaving it in Japanese yen and you're like counting the zeros. When I say it's $130, I basically mean it's one, three, zero like 130 and then two zeros on the end of it and that's what the price is in yen. It's not a direct conversion, but it is just kind of a lot easier for you to figure out the rough cost of things. So one way from Osaka to Tokyo will be $130, which is quite expensive. So most JR passes are about like 250 to $400, something like that, depends how long you get them for. If you're just going from Osaka to Tokyo and back again, it's already paid for itself. And if you're gonna be in Japan for two weeks, you're gonna be traveling around to lots of different areas, definitely worth it. 
Google Maps will tell you the price of all of the Shinkansens and any trains really that you want to catch in Japan. So go and figure out roughly where you want to go, figure out the prices and then compare that to a JR pass and that will pretty much give you your answer. Which leads on to the next thing, the cost of things. This is the part of the video that I know everyone's going to have problems with. There's either going to be comments from people saying like, Whoa, I wish I could find a hotel in Tokyo for $50 or or, well, where are you staying if you can only find a meal for $20? Like, I know there's gonna be a wide spectrum of people giving me their advice and their experience of things, of the prices of stuff in Tokyo, or just Japan in general. It's all very subjective. This is just based on my experience traveling around Japan. Here we go, ready to get canceled. So, <laughs> these will all depend on your comfort level and the things that you want to be doing when you're in Japan, but for the basic things like food, transportation, and hotels, this will be your general, general, subjective price estimate. So we've got two categories. We've got in a big city, and then we've got like countryside nature areas. In a big city, obviously things are gonna be a lot more expensive than this side, so that's where I've got the two comparisons. So cheap hotel, I'm talking like capsule hotel or a really average, <laughs> I don't know, just basic hotel with not a lot of space. In Tokyo, these can run you probably around 50 to $60. In the countryside, it would probably cost you like 20 to 30% less than that, but sometimes even more. I've seen some capsule hotels running from like $15 a night, $20 a night. You can do it quite cheap, but again, capsule hotels, they're so small and they're not super comfortable, so <laughs> keep that in mind. If you wanna see how you can do the very cheapest, cheapest day possible in Tokyo, I've made a whole video about that, where I stayed in a terrible Airbnb. Never again. <laughs> but so for a nice hotel that would give you some some kind of space and you know clean bed sheets and all of that thing in tokyo expect to pay around 100 to 120 dollars a night and then in a uh, smaller town that kind of thing i'd say maybe like 60 to 80 dollars but again in like more like naturous touristy places these can be like still it can get up there like 150 300 dollars a night but that's because it's in a like a, a touristy area in my mind i'm thinking kamikochi it would be that much money. So food, for cheap food, very, very cheap, very kind of hard to find sometimes, but you can go to just like a ramen place or like a stand-up udon shop or something like that. I've seen the prices at like 280 yen a bowl, which is very cheap and it's kind of hard to find, I think especially in Tokyo, but you can find some really cheap places, albeit a lot more like local places between like three to eight dollars a meal for like a bowl of ramen or something like that. Countryside, again, that can be like even cheaper if you wanted to. Roughly the same though, it depends how good you are at finding these deals. At like a restaurant, that'll probably cost you about 15 to 30 dollars for a meal. Then I think in the countryside, it might cost you around the same, maybe about 30% less. And then for a very expensive fancy meal like yakiniku or like an all you can eat kind of thing, that will probably be at least $40 up to up to whatever you want it to be, but I'd guess around 40 to $50 for an expensive meal and roughly the same in the countryside. I think you would find that there can be some very uh, economical places to eat meals. There was like a shabu shabu place that I used to love going to, which is like a hot pot kind of thing. It's like all you can eat for $15. So good. Also hot tip, go to places for lunchtime deals because lunchtime deals are where they're at. Transportation, so just like the subway, the loop line, the regular JR trains, these can range anywhere from like 110 yen, so like $1.10, to maybe like 300 yen, $3 for one stop, and then it will go up about 10 to 40 yen per station, depending which train you're on, obviously. They can add up quite quickly. And then for a limited express train, that can be, again, it really depends, 10 to $40. They're very fast, they're very worth the price, even though the price is quite expensive. So Osaka to Tokyo, $130. Uh, what else have I got? Osaka to Kyushu, $180, which is pretty good. And it's only like three and a half hours there or something. Tokyo to Shin Hakodate Hokuto station, basically the first station in Hokkaido, $230. But it does take four and a half hours, so really depends what your schedule is like. It might just be faster and cheaper for you to fly. It depends if they've got deals going on, that kind of thing. You really have to do a bit of hunting to figure out what's the cheapest option for you if you're really running on a budget. Anyway, public transport is very hard to put a price tag on because it really greatly depends where you're going and how fast you're trying to get there. So a great app that I love to use, Google Maps, it tells you the price of your trip. So just figure out where you wanna go, price it accordingly, figure out it might be cheaper if you just fly there, that kind of thing. Which brings me on to my next point, which is apps. 
the apps that you'll need, the only apps that you'll need for traveling Japan. These are the ones that I use very frequently. Google Maps, Google Maps, I love Google Maps. It's really helpful, especially when you're planning your trip around Japan. It, it can tell you the price of things and it can also tell you exactly what time the train is gonna arrive and leave, how long the walk is. It can even tell you which train carriage you should get on because it will give you a faster transfer to your next train. It tells you which exit to go out of, that kind of thing. It's very, very helpful and it's getting so, so, so accurate. I love Google Maps. Google Translate. Don't bother with any other translating apps. Google Translate does the job nine times out of 10. I really love the voice feature, just like voice to text. You can just speak into it. It will translate it and give you a pretty, pretty fast, pretty accurate response. They're getting a lot better. The next one is AccuWeather. I've never paid attention to the weather much before living in Japan when I realized the weather is very turbulent. It changes a lot, which is very different to Brisbane. <laughs> I just feel like the weather's mostly nice in Brisbane. But yeah, the weather changes quite a lot and layering up and especially if you're going hiking, you need a good weather app. Happy Cow is great for vegetarians or vegans or if you're traveling with a vegetarian or vegan, they've got a lot of great options on there. And the last one on the list is Imiwa. It's an offline Japanese to English, English to Japanese translation dictionary. You don't need internet, which is the best part about it. So Language. I get this question a lot and that is, can you survive traveling in Japan if you don't speak Japanese? My answer is, in a city, absolutely you can get by. You don't need to speak a lick of Japanese. You might come across some difficult situations, of course it will help you if you do speak Japanese, especially in cities, especially in Tokyo. There'll pretty much always be someone around you that can speak English. I think you'll be fine. But in saying that, I think it'd be irresponsible of me to just say, you'll be fine, just speak English. You probably should learn some Japanese. Thank you, excuse me, sorry. Those are very, very helpful. It'll get you a very long way in Japan. If you wanna learn like the best Japanese to learn specifically for traveling in Japan, I've made two whole videos about them on my channel, so go and check them out. But outside of the cities, out in more countryside areas, in nature especially, you will, you may struggle a little bit. In a lot of these areas, they're not very English-centric. Sometimes it's not a lot of English, like on menus and that kind of thing, but there'll probably still be someone around that can speak some English, you know? It's becoming a lot more common these days, especially with the younger generation. So I think you will be fine. Google Translate will help you so much. Learn as much as you can before you go. Basically, in a lot of places, to get you out of trouble, do a lot of research beforehand so that you don't get into trouble. But again, Google Translate will save you nine times out of 10. Food in Japan. I get a lot of questions, people asking me to make videos about food in Japan and I usually just avoid it completely because unfortunately, there's not a whole heap of options for vegetarians or vegans in Japan, unfortunately. It really is a sad fact. If you're a meat eater, you're gonna love Japanese food. There's so much to offer. It is so flavorful, so delicious. You can pretty much order anything and it will be great. When I used to eat meat, I would just like catch the train to a random area and I would point to things on a menu you, and it would always be delicious. Actually, except one time, it was, it was a jellyfish sushi. And I think that was the limit. That was my limit of adventure I could handle that day. If you eat meat, you're gonna have a great time. If you don't eat meat, however, it will be quite difficult. It's not impossible, but it will be difficult. If you're a vegan, it can be very restrictive. I did this for one year in Tokyo and I found it to be very restrictive. It didn't suit my lifestyle, it really didn't. I'm not gonna try and like justify my decision to go vegetarian or flexitarian or whatever. Technically, I'm not even vegetarian because I also decided to completely just ignore the fact that dashi is in pretty much everything. This is the part that makes being vegetarian or vegan very difficult. Dashi is a soup stock and it is made from either fish or from animal extract and it is used in pretty much all Japanese cooking. It's a sad fact, but it's in everything. I think when I chose to just ignore dashi, I made that decision like two years ago and it's like the most freeing experience I could have possibly done. I mentioned before, Happy Cow is a wonderful app. If you're in cities in Japan, you'll be totally fine. There's heaps of restaurants and options available. If you're out in the countryside, it will be a lot more difficult. However, there's no such thing as the vegetarian or vegan like tick or like stamp on products like there would be back in Australia or America. And most Japanese people won't know what vegan or vegetarian means. I used to have a card that said like, I am vegan and it has, I can't eat these things or whatever, and it was written in Japanese. And sometimes you can show it to people at restaurants, sometimes it works, and sometimes they look at it and they go, oh, that's gonna be too difficult, or 
oh, that means she can't eat garlic for some reason, or she can't drink alcohol for some reason, even though it's not on the card. So if you do want that information, it can be helpful if you don't speak any Japanese. I've got like a sentence written down in the description down below. You just copy that into your notes app, show it to people at restaurants, and then just cross your fingers and pray that they've got something for you. I've got a whole other video completely about being vegan or vegetarian in Japan, but my views have changed a bit since then. That was a while ago. I was still vegan back then. Being flexitarian is a decision that I would highly recommend for people coming to Japan, but it is completely up to you, of course. I have a whole nother video on the topic, so go and check that out. Otherwise, yeah, happy cow will be a savior, as will Koko Ichiban curry, because they have like five or six vegetarian vegan options on the menu, and Chris and I go there probably once a week because of it, and it's delicious, and it's cheap, and it's everywhere, so Koko curry is a great place. <laughs> also, a quick side note, some people like to say that you can't drink the water in Tokyo, like the tap water, which I... I have no idea where that rumor started, but I drank it for a whole year and I'm totally fine. And now onto the final category before the sun completely disappears, and that is the just extra little things that you should bring with you. The first thing, the number one complaint that I hear from most people when they visit Japan is that they wish that they wore more comfortable shoes. I'm not talking Converse, I'm not talking boots comfortable shoes like running shoes or like supportive shoes because you'll be walking so much more than you think you will be even if you're catching the train and that kind of thing stairs there's so many stairs everywhere in japan they love stairs there's so many stairs so bring some comfortable shoes the next thing is the plug adapter yeah it's the it's the same as the us just get an adapter for that internet will help you so much so pocket wi-fi is a really great option for foreign visitors coming to Japan. I've got one that I used to use, iVideo. I've got a discount code with them. It doesn't do anything. The last thing is common sense. Google the weather before you get here, that kind of thing. Yeah, Japan's a wonderful country. Pretty much anything you do, you're gonna have a great time here, but you can waste a lot of your time just by making silly mistakes or not Googling certain things. Your research will do you a lot of help when you're here in Japan, especially when there's a language barrier. So I hope that this video has helped in your research and has helped you to get really excited about coming to Japan because it's a wonderful country and I can't wait for people to finally be able to come here again. I'm really, really looking forward to it. That's it. That's my list. It's my huge long list. I hope that you liked this video. Thank you so much for watching it all the way to the end. If you did watch it to the end and you're not subscribed, may I recommend subscribing? YouTube app tells me how many people like watching my videos are subscribed and unsubscribed and like majority of people are unsubscribed to my channel. So if you're watching this and you're not subscribed, that'd be great. You can also give it a thumbs up and comment if you want. I have a Patreon. I release like Q and A's, exclusive updates as well as early access to my videos. And I also have an Instagram and a Twitter. Yeah, it's really dark now. It's, it's getting really, really dark. Oh, and the, the background's changed again. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so excited I have this screen now. Anyway, whatever. I'll stop talking. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.